uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I know it's kind of warm in here toward the end of the day, so really appreciate your efforts for uh, coming in here. I'll try to make this as entertaining as possible for you um, so that we can end with a bang here. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the work we've been doing in terms of developing a cognitive behavior therapy for narcolepsy. So it's what we call CBT for narcolepsy. It doesn't quite exist yet. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we're doing to try to make this a thing, okay? So let me start here. I think um, you know just about everybody here probably knows that right now there are some really good treatments for narcolepsy and hypersomnia. They tend to be medications. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has put out these guidelines uh, regarding uh, what they recommend in terms of the research evidence that supports what's effective and what isn't. And uh, you know, so things like Xyrem, uh, Adderall, uh, Provigil, New Vigil, these are some of the medications. And generally, they work pretty well. So we have some good treatments. Um, but to me, it's not quite the whole story. And so what I want to talk about is what I think is missing. And mainly it involves uh, the fact that medications can't really improve your quality of life, per se. Uh, they can reduce sleepiness, and to some extent might resolve cataplexy and some other features. But it doesn't really get at the psychosocial aspects, the health-related quality of life. So that's really what I'm going to focus on here. And uh, really, this has been quite a journey for me. And so uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about like where this journey started. So uh, I was, I'm at Northwestern now, but for many years, I was at Rush University Medical Center, which is in Chicago. Uh, it's actually just down the street from Northwestern. Uh, this is a picture of me uh, back when I was there. So it's a younger, better looking version of me. <laughs> OK, I picked that uh, picture intentionally. Uh, and then the uh, person down here is, uh, uh, the, the person here there at the bottom is Dr. Margaret Park. So uh, she is a sleep neurologist who is working with me at, at Rush. And so uh, this was probably about five or six years ago where um, she came to my office one day and said, you know, I've got all these patients with narcolepsy and they're doing fairly well with their medications, but, um, you know, they're really depressed or anxious. Is there something that you can do about it? And so I thought, well, I mean, you know, there isn't really like a good playbook for us. <laughs> you know, we don't have, like I said, a CBT for narcolepsy or really any kind of good behavioral treatment. So I said, well, I'll give it a shot. And so the first thing I did was just uh, listen to people just to get a sense of uh, what people with narcolepsy are experiencing. Uh, you know, what are the, what, you know, what are the challenges? What are uh, the, the, the burdens and the barriers of uh, managing narcolepsy and living with it? And really started connecting with people, really started understanding the suffering and the challenges uh, and, and what leads to depression and anxiety. Uh, so this is where it started. And so, uh, you know, besides just the clinical experience, I wanted to take a look and see what's out there in terms of the research literature. So uh, here, this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of a summary of what's out there right now. So in terms of quality of life, uh, so patients with narcolepsy really have significant reductions in health-related quality of life. I think most of you know this and probably experience this in terms of difficulty at school, uh, getting your homework done and so forth, at work, uh, getting to work on time, uh, functioning well at work, relationships, and, and leisure activities. This is the one that really gets me, is that, you know, it's difficult enough to have fun with narcolepsy. For most people, we don't even think about that, right? So that really struck me. And then in terms of just some of the numbers here, so about 57% of people with narcolepsy report at least mild symptoms of depression. So that's a really high proportion. And about 15% report moderate to severe symptoms of depression. So, you know, when you have it elevated to, you know, what's close to or at clinical symptoms, uh, clinical severity of depression, 15% uh, is pretty high. And the fact that this isn't something that just comes and goes, uh, you can see here the third point, it's a re the reduced quality of life is quite stable over a five-year period. Um, so, you know, this is a very persistent, uh, you know, very significant impact on quality of life. In terms of interpersonal impact, uh, again, many of you probably experience this, uh, there's relationship conflicts, so uh, challenges with marriage, potentially sexual dysfunction. Uh, this one study found that 72% of people with narcolepsy reported marital or family problems, and 20%, so one out of five, attributed the disorder to separation or divorce. Um, so people can become withdrawn or socially isolated. Um, and in children, narcolepsy can have a negative impact on the family dynamics uh, and relationship with peers. So some people might feel bullied. Uh, and, and if left untreated, this can lead to social phobia or other psychiatric disorders. Uh, so again, real profound impact in terms of interpersonal uh, functioning. And, um, you know, many of you have probably experienced this. There's a negative stigma, uh, no thanks to the media and so forth. 
Uh, and the stigma, this is a nice study by Mary Capella, who is a nurse at University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, they did a really nice study here where they looked at how perceived stigma actually is uh, uh, you know, in the pathway or one of the mechanisms that drives depression and uh, negative and, and impact social functioning there. Um, so these are some important aspects. Um, this was a nice study that just looked at, among different things, uh, what's the rate of uh, psychiatric conditions and uh, across different ones. So what they have down here, sorry, it's a little bit awkward to point here. Let me see if I can get a pointer. Okay, I guess not. Um, so uh, anyways, you can look over there. It's a little bit small, but these are some of the major uh, psychiatric disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders. And uh, just in terms of the number, so they had, this particular study had uh, control. So these are healthy people in the general population and also people with narcolepsy. And what they found is that generally speaking, with all of these major psychiatric disorders, people with narcolepsy were uh, at rates about two or three times higher than a normal population. So again, just a real significant impact here on uh, psychological and psychiatric functioning. So then I started thinking, uh, this is a young me again. Let's, oh, oh you have a picture of me or that? Okay. Um, all right. And I think there are, uh, there are some slides. I believe slides are available uh, in PDF. I think uh, maybe you can talk to the conference organizers about this. So, uh, so anyways, let me come back to the younger picture of me, because that's what I want to get to. Uh, so I started thinking about, like, all right, are there any studies that have tested ways to improve psychosocial functioning in people with narcolepsy? Right? So we talked about how in the literature, you know, there's, we recognize that, you know, yes, it has this negative impact, but has anyone done anything about it? So I work with a student. His name is Ariel Nikrug. And uh, he helped me put together this review. And we took a look at all these different non-pharmacological treatments uh, for narcolepsy that's been published. And not surprisingly, you'll see a lot of these are focused on naps. Um, and uh, some have looked at diet. Uh, other techniques, I think, that are in here involve like temperature regulation, some alternative strategies. Um, and, and again, not terribly surprising here, most of them have measured uh, outcomes related to narcolepsy. So sleep attacks, cataplexy, excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, and so forth. What we thought was interesting is that only one study actually bothered to measure psychiatric symptoms. Okay? Um, and I think they didn't find much change there. And you'll see here that there was actually no studies that actually bothered to measure quality of life as an outcome. Now, to me, that's quite striking because you look at other chronic conditions, like cancer, you know, in oncology, chronic pain, they always measure quality of life. In fact, in, in cancer studies, it's not good enough to just reduce tumor size. You also have to show an improvement in quality of life for certain drugs to get approved, right? So this is quite striking. I'm like, you know, to, so to us, we're wondering, like, why hasn't this been looked at? So, you know, our, our conclusion here is that the current treatments we have, again, mostly medications, they can reduce sleepiness, but there seems to be this unmet need for improving quality of life. Uh, improving psychosocial functioning, uh, reducing depression and anxiety. And so it does seem like we need a CBT for hypersomnia. Uh, and I should say here, just in my talk, I'm going to use hypersomnia and narcolepsy interchangeably. I mean, I understand there's some differences, but I'll kind of explain a little bit as we go along, you know, why we think that it's, uh, it is okay to combine at this point. Okay, so now I want to talk about what is the best way to scientifically develop a new CBT. So if you have an idea for a new treatment, how do you go about doing this? And this is where I want to pause for a moment and talk about different kinds of investigators. So does anyone know who the person on the left is? Colum Columbus, yeah, on the left. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. And then, all right, so, and then Columbo's the one on the right. So we have Columbus and we have Columbo, okay? Why are these two people similar or different? So Columbus is a discoverer, right? He discovered a new world. And so he was out to like, you know, like have like the discovery. He wanted to set out to find new things. That's one kind of investigator. Uh, Columbo is a different kind of investigator, right? He's someone that comes in and evaluates the evidence to figure out who done it, right? And is there enough evidence to charge someone with a crime? And then you take it to a criminal trial, right? So in, in my mind, this is sort of representative of uh, two different types of investigators. I would say that people who are basic scientists, uh, like Dr. Emmanuel Mignot, some of the other people that are looking to discover cures for narcolepsy and other conditions, those are like the Columbuses, okay? 
Uh, Columbos are people who like to do clinical research. They like to work with humans, okay? They don't work with cells or animals, and humans are very challenging people to study. <laughs> uh, and you know they sometimes like leave your study. They so sometimes don't return phone calls. So you have to wade through all this dirty evidence to try to figure out does something work. So I'm more like Columbo. Okay, <laughs> I do clinical research and uh, I like to work with people. I'm a psychologist by training, actually. Um, so uh, so anyways, that's the kind of research that I do. But let's talk for a moment about what someone like Columbus does. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are looking to develop uh, drugs based on, uh, you know, what their findings are. They're looking for cures and so forth. And so we generally have, like, the standard phases of clinical trials. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. So we have, like, the preclinical aspects of it here. This is usually looking at uh, cellular stuff, uh, sometimes animal models. So basically you're testing some ideas on different models. And you want to see, like, you know, is there, does this idea actually stand up uh, when you can really test things experimentally? And then when it gets to a point where it looks promising enough, then you take it to humans. And that's when you get into the, our, our clinical trials. There's these different phases. Phase one's usually looking at like safety and so forth. And phase two, initial indications of dose and efficacy. So it's pretty standard and to the point where it gets on the market. And then after that, you might look at things like are there any uh, adverse effects that maybe weren't detected earlier? Is it still safe for people? And you're trying to distribute it on a wider scale. So most people are quite familiar with the standard uh, development of drugs. So now let's go over to Colombo, okay? So, uh, you know, how do we develop some of these uh, behavioral trials or, you know, what we have here, mind-body trials? I'd say this is quite similar to behavioral and non-drug approaches. Um, well, so here we have words like uh, intervention, refinement, and feasibility testing. What the heck does that mean, okay? This doesn't seem to be as clear cut as like those phases of clinical trials. Uh, so here what we have is like, you know, you're basically kind of going to the well, trying to see, you know, does something work? You kind of tinker with it, you maybe refine it, uh, you test feasibility, maybe you test it on some people, get their feedback, see if they like it, you know, what do they not like. Um, so this seems kind of wishy-washy, but this is what happens when you work with humans, okay? At least as a psychologist and we do behavioral treatments, uh, we don't have test tubes, so this is sort of our version of test tubes. Um, then you get to the point where you're optimizing uh, interventions and trial methods. So here you're trying to see if you can make it better. You know, this is sort of like dosing uh, for medications, things like that. Uh, sometimes uh, the reason why trial methods are on here is that with behavioral studies, uh, we don't have the equivalent of a placebo pill, right? So a lot of times we have to spend time trying to figure out what's the best control condition. Um, so that takes some time. And then the latter stages here, these upper building blocks are much more like the standard drug development, so multi-site efficacy studies. And then pragmatic trials, these are when you try to test this in the real world uh, in the way that you would expect to deliver it, okay? So I call this the not-so-standard development of non-drug therapies. So, you know, coming back here, uh, like I said, I'm more like Colombo. So I said, well, let's develop a CBT for hypersomnia, right? So if we're going to do this, what are we thinking about here at the beginning? Well, here are some questions that usually we ask at the beginning. First of all, why should we do it? Uh, and who should receive it? Uh, is it for people with narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, um, you know, other types of hypersomnia? We need to figure that out. Uh, who should deliver it, right? Should it be a psychologist, a physician, maybe a social worker? Maybe that doesn't matter. Um, where should it be delivered? Uh, would you, if you build it, will they come? You know, is, okay, so you have this great idea, but are people with narcolepsy and hypersomnia gonna bother? Um, and what is the best way to test if this works? So these are some questions that we have in mind when we're starting off here. Um, and so the first stage I'm gonna talk about, this is really kind of where we're at, is in this intervention, refinement, and feasibility testing stage. So let me kind of walk you through what we've been doing here in terms of the early building blocks for uh, CBTH, uh, or again, you know, or CBTN, I'm kind of using that hi uh, interchangeably here. Um, so, you know, we, we want to look at is there really a need, uh, what are the treatment targets, um, and also is there evidence that people with hypersomnia will find this acceptable. So, you know, one thing you can see here at this early stage that you guys, people with hypersomnia, people with narcolepsy, you know, you can, you know, we're looking for you to partner up with us and provide input on this process. So you actually have a say, okay? Then, if that looks good, we move on to the proof of concept. So here we want to develop a prototype. So just our first starting point, you know, uh, of what a CBTH might look like. We want to identify the selection criteria and outcome measure. 
Uh, and then we want to uh, look at, just kind of conduct a preliminary test of feasibility just to see, you know, is this, uh, you know, is this uh, even likely to uh, be effective? Uh, can we pull this off? And then, you know, if we need to maybe do a little bit of refinement with our intervention. Then after that, we would go into that optimization uh, stage, maybe conducting some smaller scale clinical trials, examine the benefits versus the harms, okay? So just to give you an idea of some of the early stages and, and where we're at with things. So the first, let me talk about our work in uh, the phase one, the concept viability. So uh, we published a study uh, about a couple years ago, I think, a year or so ago. Uh, again, this was uh, with a couple of collaborators of mine. So this was a survey study, and, and there may even be some people here who completed the survey study. Uh, we had about uh, 371 people complete this. Uh, these were 33 items. It was completely anonymous. Uh, it only took about 10 minutes. So just a very quick snapshot of some questions we had related to uh, mental health symptoms and, and, and uh, you know, some ideas for what a CBT for hypersomnia might look like. Um, it was predominantly female. Uh, and then the average age was 37 years old. Uh, quite a bit of range here. We had anyone from 17 years old to 72 years old completing this. Uh, the average age of the symptom onset of hypersomnia was 17.9 or about 18 years old. Uh, so fairly young uh, group. So one of the things we found here is with mental health symptoms, um, so these first, uh, the top two are actually the cardinal symptoms of depression. So feeling sad or depressed uh, and losing interest in things that you normally enjoy. And you can see uh, a little over 80% of people actually endorse that. And there wasn't much difference between people with narcolepsy or people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So clearly people who are filling out our uh, survey uh, were experiencing some pretty severe symptoms of depression. Uh, these other ones, irritability, social isolation, concentration, guilt, worthlessness, these are also some associated symptoms of depression. And you can see, again, here, you know, really high rates of endorsement between 65 and 91 percent. Uh, and in the bottom two, there are symptoms of anxiety and worry. So again, we have uh, about like two-thirds, three-quarters of the people endorsing these. So this is a really high rate. Uh, and I would say that these are symptoms. So this isn't a diagnosis of a mood disorder uh, or an anxiety disorder. So these are just people who endorse symptoms, okay? Uh, and, and then the other thing, again, is that there isn't really any difference between people with narcolepsy or people with idiopathic hypersomnia. And that's one of the reasons why we thought it might be okay to combine those two, uh, you know, for our purposes, because it's the burden and uh, the impact of this, these conditions that we're uh, most interested in trying to intervene on. So we also asked some questions about what kind of behavioral strategies are you currently uh, trying? And not surprisingly, most people here were trying daytime naps. Um, scheduled sleep time, this is more like the nighttime uh, sleep, uh, you know, having a regular schedule, for example. Um, about two-thirds of people were endorsing that. Uh, then we get into some other things like caffeine. Again, you know, not surprisingly, most people are using exercise, diet, and then mindfulness, uh, which is a form of meditation and yoga. These are some more alternative strategies. Um, so, you know, people are engaging in a lot of different things besides just medication. So this is kind of what we were interested in. Uh, what I was really uh, intrigued by was this question we asked, which is, how did you learn these strategies? And you'll see 78% said trial and error, okay? Um, so it's not like this is some formal technique that somebody t taught them. It's just, uh, let me just give this a shot and see if it does anything. Uh, the internet was 44%. That came in second place. And then other patients was 38%. It isn't until you got the fourth place here where you had sleep specialists and the physicians, <laughs> okay? So... This was sort of eye-opening for me because it showed us that, you know, people are trying these things, but we don't have any scientific evidence that any of this stuff helps because people are just sort of wing it. They're doing it on their own. So we really should try to test these things and see, you know, do these things work and can we test it and, and, and maybe have some kind of package in a systematic way. So uh, then we started asking people, you know, if we, we kind of explained a little bit of what we thought CBT for hypersomnia would look like and said, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And uh, a good portion, about 41% said, yeah, we'd be really interested. 32% uh, said somewhat interested. So overall, about like three quarters of the people were at least somewhat interested. Um, we also asked people, well, what about things like support groups to get an idea of what kind of format you would like. Um, people really like support groups. Uh, and, you know, uh, organizations like Narcolepsy Network certainly have some of those. Uh, and then, uh, so you can see, you know, just a small minority really uh, didn't really like the support groups or weren't interested. So our summary here, what we learned is that people with hypersomnia are interested in a CBT program. Um, it seems like there's some indication that a group format might be a little bit more favored. 
Um, there's also widespread use of some of these non-drug approaches to manage the symptoms, but most of this is, again, through trial and error or social media, so not a good systematic way to test this to see if it works. And in terms of symptoms of mental health, depression, anxiety are very high, so we see these as potential treatment targets. So now, moving on here to the next step. So this is what I would call the proof of concept. So now it seems that it's viable that we can do this. Let's start to take it to the next step. So we were fortunate enough to get a small grant from Wake Up Narcolepsy to uh, collect some preliminary data uh, using focus groups. And what we wanted to see is whether or not, uh, you know, what's going on with current treatments? Are these adequate for addressing your psychosocial needs? I'll say part of the reason why we went with this project is because we, at this point, had started trying to submit research grants to see if we can launch this, you know, and get some money to really start to test this, uh, do some research on it. And the feedback we kept getting from reviewers was, well, okay, um, you know, this sounds okay, but we're not convinced that, you know, people with narcolepsy, why can't they see their psychologists? Why can't they see their psychiatrist? Or, you know, what is it about, like, current treatments that are insufficient? So we wanted to basically tackle that and get some data on that. And we ran focus groups because uh, this is a nice way to get qualitative data. And what qualitative data is, it's getting people's feedback that goes above and beyond the numbers. So quantitative data is when you get ask like surveys, you get numbers, you can calculate averages. That's certainly very helpful. Uh, and that's what most people think of research, but qualitative data is a little bit different. This goes beyond that. And so what we thought was important here was to get people's stories, to get something that it's a little bit more rich than just what the numbers can tell us. So we ran these focus groups. We've actually just finished this up. So this is a very recent thing. Uh, I'm going to give you some things that are hot off the press. So this is on 29 people with narcolepsy. Uh, and we actually did these focus groups online. It was actually pretty neat. We uh, uh, got a really nice response. We even, our last focus group, I remember we had somebody from the UK, someone from Argentina. Uh, and so it, it actually became international. That became a challenge to schedule a common time. <laughs> the person in the UK, I think it was like 2 AM when she joined us. Um, so uh, yeah, I said, all right, we'll forgive you for not following your regular sleep schedule tonight. But. Um, uh, so again, we had a lot more women than men. So guys, where are you in our research studies, right? We need you. Um, uh, it was predominantly Caucasian, predominantly white, a small uh, percentage of minorities. Again, a fairly young uh, group, 31 years was the average age. A fairly well-educated group. Uh, most people had a, a college degree. And uh, uh, most of our people had uh, narcolepsy type 1. So most had cataplexy. Uh, there was about 11 people who didn't. And then the time since diagnosis, so these are people who were uh, fairly recent in their diagnosis, so a little over four years. Um, and the questions we asked were generally in these four domains. So one is uh, some questions about the public perception of narcolepsy, how's it affected them, or uh, quality of life, different domains, different areas, uh, again, trying to probe a little bit further than what we've gotten in our uh, surveys. Uh, Treatment-related questions, you know, how are current treatments working, what isn't working, and also some ideas in terms of the delivery of CBTH. So um, it, I'll emphasize here that this is still a work in progress, so we're not totally done with our data analysis. And with qualitative data analysis, it's a little bit harder. You can't just kind of calculate an average and go with that number. You have to go and, and do this sort of iterative process where you're looking for different themes. So this takes a while. So what I'm showing you here is just kind of our first pass as we're looking at it, what seemed to really jump out at us. So it, you know, this isn't quite finalized yet, but I wanted, I think this is exciting. I wanted to show you some of the stuff that we're, we're finding. So the first set of questions involves uh, public perception of narcolepsy. And not surprisingly, most people said that, no, the public really doesn't understand narcolepsy. Um, people have commented, one person said, it's an invisible disease. Um, you know, it's hard to, for other people to know I have narcolepsy unless I like, wear like a name tag or something like that. Um, the negative portrayal by the media, so, you know, uh, whether it's like TV shows or movies, you know, a lot of times that's what people talk about when they, you know, try to uh, mention, oh, I have narcolepsy. Like, oh, yeah, you're just like that person that I saw in that movie. Um, others think it's an excuse or they're skeptical that it's real, so some people encounter that part of it, uh, that there's sort of this disbelief of, of narcolepsy. Um, and, and one person I thought, uh, you know, had, sort of summarize it well, they said, I hate it when others say, oh, I wish I could sleep all day. You know, like, oh, as if this is like some, some desirable thing, you know. So, you know, I, I think this is, you guys probably know this, but these are some of the things that jumped out to us of what people are saying. So again, this goes above and beyond just what we can capture in numbers. Um, 
we also asked people, well, who have you told uh, that you have narcolepsy? And this is interesting because there's mixed results. Some people were hesitant to tell others about the diagnosis. Uh, some people said it's for fear of like some repercussions, some consequence. Other people said it was helpful to talk, tell other people because it helped them process and cope with it, helped help them understand that, you know, this is something I actually have. So there's some mixed responses there. Um, and overall, like this was a nice quote. Someone said, I get tired trying to explain why I am tired. Okay, and, and I think that's quite appropriate. Um, okay, so then we wanted to get into how has narcolepsy affected your quality of life? So things that seemed to jump out to us were a lack of control, the unpredictability of the symptoms, so it's difficult to plan things, whether it's work, social and fun activities. Again, it kind of goes back to that leisure activity that uh, you know, we talked about earlier. It's difficult to engage in fun activities here. Um, there, the impact on school and work can be very challenging. Uh, some people talked about avoiding careers uh, they thought would be too exhausting. Uh, some people felt that they were underemployed, that they could certainly do more if they didn't have narcolepsy uh, and how to manage these symptoms. Uh, people talked about la lack of trust from employers, from teachers, from professors. Um, and, you know, so again, just a very, very significant effect there on uh, school and, and work. And then uh, lots of negative effects on self-image. So things like low self-worth, uh, issues with self-confidence, self-efficacy. Uh, people talked about being less capable than they feel that they uh, used to be or want to be. Uh, for some people with cataplexy, they talked about avoiding certain places. You know, whether it was like, you know, going to like comedy movies, uh, you know, or just some places where they're more prone to having cataplectic attacks. Uh, there was this avoidance. Uh, and then uh, several people talked about even feeling ashamed that they have narcolepsy. So clearly a very profound effect on your self-image. Uh, and, and this is a nice quote that I, I thought also kind of captured this domain. Somebody said, I tend to focus on who I want to be, but I really need to focus on who I am. So there's always this kind of comparison of, you know, either, you know, what they were before or what somebody else is like, but they really wanted to try to focus on who they really are at this time. So then we asked about current treatment. So we wanted to get a sense, are they adequate? How's it going? So first we asked about their uh, sleep management and, and uh, uh, their work with their sleep doctors and their sleep clinics. So most patients were being seen by their sleep doctors about every three to six months, which is you know, about what the, is recommended in the standard guidelines. Um, and, and generally speaking, they said it was going pretty well, that they felt that their sleep doctors were on top of medication management, talking about symptoms. Um, but when it came to some of the psychosocial aspects, uh, there was a little bit of a mixed response, but generally speaking, they felt that, you know, the sleep doctor is generally okay at listening, but they didn't really have a whole lot to offer in terms of advice giving or recommendations. Um, so they felt that, uh, uh, you know, that was missing. Some people said that, you know, my sleep doctor is great, but just doesn't have that much time to spend with me. I think there were a few people who mentioned that uh, a nurse or a physician's assistant was actually really helpful because that's really who they talked to about some of the psychosocial aspects. So, you know, it just sort of gave us some insight on how things are working in a sleep clinic and, and what's working and what's not working. Then we asked some people about like, uh, whether or not they were working with a mental health provider and what their experiences were. And then there was, I'd say, maybe like about 30 or 40% of the uh, people we interviewed did seem to be working with a mental health provider. Um, th m most of them felt like their mental health provider did not understand narcolepsy. I think there was one person that said their therapist actually had idiopathic hypersomnia. <laughs> and so that was very rare. And so they actually did connect with their therapist there. Um, but for the most part, people didn't. And they did feel that this lack of therapist knowledge regarding narcolepsy did seem to impact their ability to, to trust and connect with their therapist. So, you know, that did have a potential impact on that therapeutic relationship, uh, which in, in psychology is very important for us. Uh, and then that also there was frustration with lack of coordination among the treatment providers. So some people said, well, okay, so I have my sleep doctor here. I have my, my psychologist or psychiatrist here. I have my primary care doc there. You know, they're, they can be, they're, they're good and they're different things, but there isn't this coordination. And so sometimes I'm sort of stuck in between. So there was some of that uh, frustration. Uh, and, and so another quote that we thought was, was really captured this area quite well, uh, somebody said, you know, it's, it seems like it's either one or the other, meaning that whoever the provider is is either knowledgeable about narcolepsy or sleep or mental health, but it's really rare to find someone who can do both, okay? So then uh, we, our last set of questions was about uh, how should we deliver CBTH? 
so first we asked people, well, um, you know, what do you think the qualifications are? And you know, our initial idea was should it be like a you know a mental health provider, like a psychologist, psych a psychiatrist, or maybe social worker, or more of a medical person. Turns out people said it doesn't really matter. I don't really care. You know, I just want them to be trained with working with narcolepsy. That was actually the most important thing people told us. So uh, so that was really really important for us to hear and understand. Um, in terms of the format, some people preferred group, other people preferred, in, preferred individual formats. Um, since we were actually doing these focus groups online, uh, we started asking people, well, what do you think about doing this online? And that was actually, we got a very strong positive response to that. Um, so that's actually helped us brainstorm a little bit. Uh, I, I don't think we had that initial concept, but uh, we're actually starting to think more in that direction. And when we asked about different components that might be uh, helpful and useful, uh, people talked about processing, group support as one, uh, journaling, logging things, uh, whether it's like sleep-wake activities or things on your mind, emotional things. Uh, having an outlet there seemed to be helpful. Um, having some structure and scheduling, both in terms of the daytime part as well as the nighttime part, uh, seemed to be helpful. That was a recommendation from folks. Uh, uh, some emotion regulation strategies, so mindfulness, yoga. So now we're tapping into some complementary and alternative approaches. Uh, and then uh, some people had some interesting ideas here. Uh, one person said, uh, how about if you bring a family member? You know, have like something like either bring a family member day <laughs> or you know, like maybe the part of the group would be with a family member and maybe there's a way to weave that in because they felt it was important for their support person to also understand some of the things that they're learning uh, in this type of program. So that's something that we're thinking about, uh, trying to find a way to integrate that. And then the last part here is actually quite interesting. It's advocacy, how to take initiative, the legal aspects of it. You know, this sort of came about with some of the challenges people were finding at the workplace or at school, people not recognizing that narcolepsy is actually a medical condition and, you know, are people not taking it seriously. So people suggested actually having a little bit of education in there to help people understand what their rights are and what they can do in these different situations. Okay. So, uh, so that was a focus group, and that really helped us uh, kind of rethink a few things. Uh, you know, some things we didn't quite anticipate, but that's kind of why we want to do this. And if you'll remember, at this early stage, there's that kind of refinement, and you know, so it is. You know, the, we we kind of go back and forth between the drawing board and and, and creating something. So our next step, which is where we are now, is to actually do a pilot test of CBTH. So here we were lucky enough to receive a research grant from the American Sleep Medicine Foundation. Uh, and the goals here are to develop and refine this uh, first uh, format of CBTH, uh, to identify the optimal delivery format, so whether it's individual, in groups, uh, online, and so forth, uh, and just to conduct some initial testing uh, to see is this feasible, is it acceptable to patients. So what we're doing here is testing this prototype. Uh, our, our first thought is it should be something about a six session. Uh, usually we do these sessions in, in, in consecutive weeks. So it would be like a six weekly uh, form of, of CBTH. Um, our first thought is because we want to try to test this is to have it open both online and in person. Um, and one of the things we want to test is to randomize, randomize people to whether they want to receive it individually or in a group format, just so we can test out some of these different formats. Okay, we want to actually go through some of that testing now before we get to like, you know, a, a later stage where we want to have things more set. Um, and one of the things that we are starting to require is that people do need to have an established diagnosis of narcolepsy. It could be type 1 or type 2. Um, and we're also, for this stage, including people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Because again, I think right now we don't think there's a good reason to separate those people. Um, and so they do have to have established care because the idea here is that the CBTH is not meant to replace your standard treatment. This is an adjunctive treatment, so it's really something on top of it. Okay, so it should, you know, the idea is it's, it, it's combined with what your current standard care uh, is. So we're not doing things like medication and so forth uh, with, with our intervention. So here are the treatment modules that we have that, that you know, we think is a good starting place. So the, the first thing is education about hypersomnia. What is it? Um, you know, and the idea here is to give people some information so that they can more effectively explain to other people, you know, what is narcolepsy, what is IH, what is cataplexy, what are some of these different symptoms. Um, so it's to kind of arm people uh, with that knowledge. Uh, then we have some tools uh, that are targeting uh, self-identity, self-image, 
ways to improve that, um, some structured sleep and waking activities. Uh, you know, what, what can you do there? I'll give you an example here in a minute. Um, talking about coping skills. So uh, in, in psychology, and I'm, I call myself more of a clinical health psychologist, this is really where we have a lot of tools that we have found to be helpful in other areas, like chronic pain or coping with uh, cancer and diagnosis that we can kind of borrow into uh, and adapt it into uh, people with hypersomnia. Um, social support, again, you know, the importance here and, and, you know, trying to figure out ways to integrate family members and support people in this process. And, and then, uh, again, the medical, legal, and occupational I issues, which we think is going to be, you know, a nice uh, component here. And our, our first approach, I should say, is that we, we're trying this in modules because we realize that not every module might be needed for every person, and, and there may be different ways to arrange the modules. So we're trying to take this in sort of this engineering uh, approach of having these different modules so that maybe later on people can mix and match as, as you know, this goes into further stages of testing. So let me give you an example here, just so you can get some flavor of, of the type of things that we have in mind. So this is what I would call the Pomodoro technique. And this technique actually comes from just basic time management techniques. Uh, I think Pomodoro is actually a tomato. Uh, we, we don't give tomatoes here. This actually has nothing to do with a tomato. Uh, but the idea is that we want to split up large intervals of time into smaller in intervals to make it a little bit more manageable. And um, so the idea is that you want to set these intervals for work separated by short breaks. That's actually the technique that they use in time management. Here, the idea is that we want people to reconceptualize wakefulness. Okay, and what I mean by that is for most people, especially people who don't have sleep issues, they think of the daytime as one continuous time, right? From the time that you wake up to the time that you go to bed at night, these 16 to 18 hours are continuous. For people with hypersomnia, maybe we need to think about it differently, right? Maybe we need to break it up into smaller parts. Uh, that might give you more of an opportunity to take a nap. It also can be a little bit easier to deal with, or, you know, it can be kind of daunting because if you only have a certain energy level and maybe that runs out after three or four hours, it can be daunting to think, okay, I got to get all this stuff done. I got about 16 hours to do this. So here, what we're trying to do is break this up into smaller maybe more, you know, sort of easier chunks to work with. And this is as much really as a cognitive technique as it is a behavioral one. Um, but this can be quite effective. And it gives people at least a plan of how to approach the day and maybe how to split it up into smaller pieces. Um, so this is an example of a diary. Uh, this is actually one I developed when I was at Rush. I should probably change that to Northwestern now. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea here, so you know what we're doing here is having, for example, all right, we hear your morning activities. And usually we'll give some more specific uh, uh, instructions or recommendations based on what the person does. So it's customized to their person's lifestyle and their schedule. Uh, and then there's a break, you know, there's a nap time. And you know, for some people, maybe they can do two naps, other people one. You know, so again, we adapt this. Um, and for other people, maybe it, you know, they don't actually fall asleep, but it's a rest period. Okay, so we can customize this a little bit. Then there's this af afternoon period. So we talk about, well, what are the different things you can do in the afternoon? Uh, and then another nap period, and in the evening. And then, you know, for some people, there might be a third nap period. Um, typically, it, you know, then you get into the nighttime part. So this diary focuses on what to do during the daytime. Um, but just to give you an example and an idea of some of the things that uh, we're trying to do. So um, this study actually is one that is an ongoing study, and uh, I actually do have some handouts. We actually are in the process of recruiting. Um, we, uh, we haven't actually started running any of our interventions yet. We're, we're, we had a little bit of, of turnover in our staff, so uh, we're getting things sort of re, uh, reset, but we're actually going to be starting this uh, this fall. So if anybody's interested in this, and, and I will say it isn't limited to people in the local area because we are, are doing this online. And that was one of the things that we changed after listening to our feedback from the focus group. So uh, even if you're not local into Chicago or Indiana or anything like that, if you're interested, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, contact us. You can uh, send us an email at that uh, at email address here. It's linkstudy at northwestern.edu. Uh, our phone number is there. You can leave a message there. I do have some handouts here and some flyers if anybody's interested. So, uh, or if you know other people who might be interested, um, you know, please help us spread the word. Uh, so we're looking for probably about like 32 people. Uh, and again, you know, some of this can be done online. So um, you know, it uh, doesn't have to be uh, uh, limited to location or geography. Okay. So um, that's kind of where we are right now, okay? And uh, you know, we feel that we've made some progress, but there's certainly a whole lot more work to do. 
Um, so we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, I do want to take a moment to just acknowledge a few people here. So our research assistants in, in, in my lab, uh, Sophie and, and Riley were uh, students, uh, and then some of the collaborators I've worked with, uh, people who have, uh, the organizations who have helped fund our research, and a big thanks uh, particularly to people in our uh, studies uh, who are willing to share their stories. Uh, so without you guys, you know, certainly none of this would be possible. And so, you know, at the beginning, I talked about how this has been a journey, and uh, I want to come back to that because, you know, it's often said that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Um, sometimes that journey <laughs> takes you to some unexpected places. I did not start off studying narcolepsy. I started off studying insomnia. You know, it's just, these are people who can't fall asleep. Um, but it's been interesting how it's taken me to this place. And I'm actually quite excited and glad uh, to be able to do some of this work. And the other thing I'll say is that this work is our work. It's shared work. I, the reason why I went through the process of explaining how we develop behavioral treatments is because in developing behavioral treatments, you guys, all of you guys can help make a difference. You're part of that process. So we need you guys, okay? And this is a rare occasion where you have an input. You can help shape our interventions by letting us know what has, you know, how your lives have been affected, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So it's a unique opportunity. So that's why I say this is as much uh, my journey as it is yours. And many people have shared their journeys of getting diagnosed with narcolepsy, how long that took, and so forth. So I really have connected with that and really hope that we can work together on this, okay? So with that, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for staying late this afternoon.